my microphone was off. So um, welcome to part seven. Um, part seven is entitled Lunch with Mr. Wolfsheim. Um, it's on my page 69 um, at the um, paragraph that starts Roaring Noon. Um, remember, this is the day that um, Nick as, is going to meet Gatsby for lunch. Okay, so Nick had already ridden up to town early that morning um, to work with Gatsby. Gatsby gave him a ride, but anyway, they're going to meet. Roaring Noon. In a well-fanned 42nd cellar, Second Street cellar, I met Gatsby for lunch. So 42nd Street cellar, that sounds like a speakeasy, okay? So I wrote speakeasy beside that. It's definitely um, not open to the public. You kind of have to know people to get in, and it's a little bit dark. And um, if it's a cellar, you know, it, it's out of the way. Blinking away the brightness of the street outside, my eyes picked him out obscurely in the anteroom, talking to another man. Mr. Carraway, this is my friend, Mr. Wolfsheim. A small, flat-nosed Jew raised his large head and regarded me with two fine growths of hair, which luxuriated in either nostril. After a moment, I discovered his tiny eyes in the half-darkness. So this is um, your first glimpse of Mr. Wolfsheim. This is um, a description of him. So I took one look at him, said Mr. Wolfsheim, shaking my hand earnestly. And, and what do you think I did? What? I inquired politely. I inquired politely, but evidently he was not addressing me, for he dropped my hand and covered Gatsby with an expressive nose. I handed the money to Katzpa and I said, all right, Katzpa, don't pay him a penny until he shuts his mouth. And he shut it right then and there. So he's kind of in the middle of a conversation with Gatsby continues while shaking, you know, talking to Gatsby while shaking Nick's hand over here. Okay. Now, um, I will let you know that it's probable at this point that uh, Mr. Wolfsheim, because of where they're meeting and some things that are going to happen in just a minute, that he is part of organized crime, that he's part of, you know, mafia. So I want to, I want you to mark some things that um, hints or clues that might tell you that he is, you know, um, a, part of organized crime or part of, you know, that, that business. So the first one I put um, that he, you know, that he's mobbed up or that he's legal. The first one is um, talking about Katzpa. All right, Katzpa, don't pay him a penny till he shuts his mouth. That kind of sounds like that's not banking, right? That's not like, um, you know, just like, um, you know, working in like um, real estate. That seems kind of illegal. Okay. So I mark that. Um, Gatsby took an arm of each of us and moved forward to the restaurant, whereupon Mr. Wolfsheim swallowed a new sentence he was um, starting and lapsed into a some ambulatory ab abstraction. And I looked that up, that word up, some ambulat some ambulatory. I can't think of the word, but anyway, that's like sleepwalking. Okay. Um, highballs asked the head waiter. Those are drinks, by the way. This is a nice restaurant here, said Mr. Wolfshine, looking at the Presbyterian nymphs on the ceiling. But I like the street, I like the across the street better. Yes, highballs, agreed Gatsby. And then to Mr. Wolfshine, it's too hot over there. Hot and small, yes, said Mr. Wolfshine, but full of memories. What place is that? I asked. The old Metropole. The old Metropole, brooded Mr. Wolfshine gloomily, filled with faces dead and gone, filled with faces gone now forever. I can't forget so long as I live the night they shot Rosie Rosenthal there. It was six of us at the table and Rosie had eaten and drunk all evening. And when it was almost morning, the waiter came up to him with a funny look and says, somebody wants to speak to him outside. All right, says Rosie and begins to get up. And I pulled him down into a chair. Let the bastards come in here if they want you, Rosie. But don't you so help me move outside this room. It was four o'clock in the morning then. And if we'd have raised the blinds, we'd have seen daylight. Did he go? I asked innocently. Sure he went. Mr. Wilshire's nose flashed at me indignantly. He turned around um, in the door and says, don't let that waiter take away my coffee. Then he went onto the sidewalk and they shot him three times in his full belly and drove away. Four of them were electrocuted, I said, remembering. Okay, so I marked this. This is the second um, kind of piece of evidence. Again, a banker or, you know, someone who is... Um, in a regular business, isn't going to talk about his friend getting, um, you know, shot in the belly after they, you know, called him outside and, and that kind of thing. And then they got electrocuted for it. So I marked this as the second um, clue or textual evidence to where he's mobbed up or he's illegal. 
And then um, Wilson goes on to say, five with Becker, his nostrils turned to me in, in an interested way. I understand you're looking for a business connection. Now, this is part of his accent. Um, he means connection, okay? Um, and when he says connection, business connection, um, this is another clue. This is my number three clue that he is, um, he's mobbed up, okay? So he asked Nick, he's like, so you, you, you want in? I hate that I'm acting like I, I know anything about mobsters and I'm trying to act like them. The juxtaposition of these two remarks was startling. Gatsby answered for me. Oh no, he exclaimed, this isn't the man. No, Mr. Wilsheim seemed disappointed. This is just a friend. I told you that we talk about that some other time. I beg your pardon, said Mr. Wilsheim. I had the wrong man. So Gatsby is super quick to make him understand. No, 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 this isn't it. He's keeping his two worlds separate, right? Nick is not part of the illegal side. So no, 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 okay. Um, a succulent hash arrived and Mr. Wilshine, forgetting the more sentimental atmosphere of the old metropole, began to eat with, a, with ferocious delicacy. His eyes, meanwhile, roved very slowly all about the room. He completed uh, the arc by turning to um, inspect the people directly behind. I think that, except for my presence, he would have taken one short glance beneath our table. So I mark this as number four simply because he looks paranoid. Okay, he's eating but he's looking around like the entire time he's drinking, you know, and he's just kind of knowing his surroundings and he know, knowing like who's in the room. He even kind of looks behind him. Okay. There's only a few reasons why someone would be doing that. And one of the main ones is that he he's, he's paranoid. He's on guard. Okay. He's like watching. And if you're doing something illegal, you need to know who's around. You need to know, you know, who's in your area. So that's what he's doing. So that's my fourth, um, uh, inference or textual evidence that, you know, that's what he, that he is mobbed up. Look here, old sport, said Gatsby, leaning toward me. I'm afraid I made you a little angry this morning in the car. Remember he asked, he told him, he said um, that Jordan was going to ask a request of him. And Nick was kind of like, why don't you just say it? So he, he's, he picked up on the fact that Nick was kind of annoyed by this. There was that smile again, but this time I held out against it. I don't like mysteries, I answered. And I don't understand why you just won't come out and frankly tell me what you want. Why has it all got to come through Miss Baker? It's, oh, it's nothing underhand, he assured me. Miss Baker's a great sportswoman, you know, and she'd never do anything that wasn't all right. Okay, the fact that he mentions this, probably too much, right? Because we already know that she cheated in a round, even though nobody, you know, she didn't get caught. We know about this. And so he says, oh, no, no, it's nothing like that. And Nick's kind of like, that's not what I was worried about. I just kind of, I don't like mysteries. Just tell me. Suddenly he looked at his watch, jumped up and hurried from the room, leaving me with Mr. Wolfsheim at the table. He has to telephone, said Mr. Wolfsheim, following him with his eyes. Fine fellow, isn't he? Handsome to look at and a perfect gentleman. Yes. He's an Oxford man. Oh, so now um, Gatsby's off from the table. Well, he's going to talk about Gatsby to Nick. Okay, so some of it may corroborate what he's already heard. Some of it may tell him something new. But I marked that Wilsheim is describing uh, because you're going to have to um, to write some of this in there. Um, but Oxford, that's his his, um, his accent again. That means Oxford. Oh, he went to Oxford College in England. You know, you you know Oxford College. I've heard of it. It's one of the most famous colleges in the world. Have you known Gatsby for a long time? I inquired. Several years, he answered in a gratified way. I made the pleasure of his acquaintance just after the war. But I knew I had discovered a man of fine breeding after I had talked with him for an hour. I said to myself, there's the kind of man you take home to introduce to your mother and your sister. That is the quote that um, Mr. Gatsby, or that, Wolfsheim, Mr. Wolfsheim uses to describe Gatsby that I ask you about in your, um, your questions. He says, there's the kind of man you'd like to take home and introduce to your mother and sister. Now think about that. Your mother and sister, they're important to you. So you don't, you only take them, you know, introduce them to the best. So he really has a lot of um, good feelings and he's, um, he, he admires Gatsby. Okay. Then he says, he paused. I see you're looking at my cuff buttons. I hadn't been looking at them, but I did now. They were composed of oddly familiar pieces of ivory. 
And so he's talking about like cufflinks, like people who um, men who are dressed really nice. They um, they have cufflinks that kind of hold their um, their pockets together. And sometimes they're diamonds. Sometimes they're, um, you know, just certain things. And he says he's looking at them now and they're pieces of um, ivory, oddly shaped. <clears throat> Finest specimen of human molars, he informed me. Um, do you know what a human molar is? This. So my man has human molars for cufflinks. Mr. Wolfsheim does. Hmm. Why would someone have human molars as cufflinks? Knowing what we know about Mr. Wolfsheim, he's probably an organized crime. He probably has to use some violence to um, get things done. Um, could they belong to someone that he had to um, get some information out of? Um, I don't know. To me, it's um, extremely gross. Teeth that are not in someone's mouth do not need to be worn as, um, you know, part of your clothing. It, just my opinion. Okay. Ew. But anyway, Nick's kind of like, okay, they're teeth. Hmm. Well, I inspected him. That's a very interesting idea. Yeah. He flipped his sleeves up under his coat. Yeah. Yeah. Gatsby's very careful about women. He would never so much look at a friend's wife. It's kind of weird that this would just be the next thing. We go from, you know, looking at his molars and then back to Gatsby, which is normal, but then he would never look at a friend's wife. All right. When the subject of this instinctive trust, trust returned to the table and sat down, Mr. Wolfshine drank his coffee with a jerk and got to his feet. I've enjoyed my lunch, he said, and I'm going to run off from you two young men before I outstay my welcome. Don't hurry, Meyer said Gatsby without enthusiasm. Mr. Wolfsheim raised his hand in a sort of benediction. You're very polite, but I belong to another generation, he announced solemnly. You sit here and discuss your sports and your young ladies and your... He supplied an imaginary noun with another wave of his hand. As for me, I am 50 years old and I won't impose myself on you any longer. As he shook hands and turned away, his tragic nose was trembling. I wondered if I had said something, anything to offend him. He becomes very sentimental sometimes, explained Gatsby. This is one of his sentimental days. He's quite a character around New York, a denizen of Broadway. And I looked up denizen and wrote it down. This is someone who, um, who frequents a place regularly. So he's often seen you know, at Broadway shows. Um, okay, so Mr. Um, Wilshine leaves. Um, and, but before he leaves, while Gatsby is gone, he tells Nick, um, you know, he, glowing, like he kind of gives a resume of Gatsby a glowing resume, you know, he's, um, he's a good guy, you know, he's trustworthy, all this kind of stuff, fine breeding, a great gentleman, and then he leaves. Um, it kind of feels like a setup to me, simply because um, if, you know, Nick didn't necessarily believe Gatsby on the way there, if he kind of got, you know, annoyed with the way um, he was telling him about himself, maybe he needed someone else to come in and, you know, reaffirm how Gatsby's a good guy, so he'll do this favor for him. Anyway, Nick is not really picking up on it, um, but we'll see if he does. Who is he anyhow? An actor? No. A dentist? Why does he ask if, um, why does he ask Gatsby if Mr. Wilshine is a dentist? This is why I love Nick. He's very innocent and um, he doesn't get the fact that those are teeth probably from someone he like was torturing and getting information out of and he pulled those out of some, you know, poor guy's mouth and now he's wearing them. He assumes, well, maybe he's a dentist. And, you know, that's just like his style choice. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, Mayor Wolfsheim? No, he's a gambler. And Gatsby hesitated. And then he said, added coolly, he's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. Okay, so we have all these clues about, you know, him being illegal or mobbed up. But now this is an actual, like, him saying he's a gambler. So this isn't one of the... Um, uh, this is, you know, actual evidence, but um, we have many clues before that, um, you know, that he is. But he, he's a gambler. And then he says he fixed the World Series um, back in 1919. And I need to explain this because one year I didn't because I just assumed that everyone knew about this. But um, back in 1919, there was a team, um, the White Sox, Chicago White Sox, where people, um, gamblers, we're going to bet on the other team. I can't remember who the other team was. So they paid members of the White Sox to um, to mess up, to throw the World Series so that when the other team won, they would get more money. Highly illegal, really, really wrong. But it's called when you fix an outcome, that's what it means. 
Um, I was teaching this one year, and this is why I feel the need to explain this, because this one girl, so sweet, she raised her hand and she said, I don't understand um, that how what it means that he fixed the World Series. Um, it was broken. And she was being very serious. Um, she did not. She had never heard that terminology before. So I want to make sure that um, that people understand that that's like um, when you fix an outcome, it's so that you'll win money. And the people um, in real life, this really did happen. And many people got in trouble for it. Um, and some people were banned from, the players were banned from baseball. They could never play um, again. Um, but anyway, so he's saying this is the guy who did it. Fix the World Series, I repeated. The idea staggered me. I remembered, of course, that the World Series had been fixed in 1919. But if I had thought of it at all, I would have thought of it as a thing that merely happened the end of some inevitable chain it never occurred to me that one man could start to play with could start to play with the faith of 50 million people with the single mindedness of a burglar blowing a safe so he's just kind of like oh my goodness this guy did that how did he happen to do that i asked after a minute he just saw an opportunity why isn't he in jail they can't get him old sport he's a smart man I insisted on paying the check. As the waiter brought my change, I caught sight of Tom Buchanan across the crowded room. Come along with me for a minute, I said. I've got to say hello to someone. When he saw us, Tom jumped up and took half a dozen steps in our direction. Where have you been? He demanded eagerly. Daisy's furious because you haven't called up. Uh, this is Mr. Gatsby, Mr. Buchanan. They shook hands and a strained, unfamiliar look of embarrassment came over Gatsby's face. So he's um, now Nick has the opportunity to, to, um, to introduce Mr. Gatsby to one of his friends. Okay, so he introduces and they shake hands, but there's a weird look on um, Gatsby's face and he doesn't really understand why. How have you been anyhow, demanded Tom of me. How'd you happen to come up this far to eat? I've been having lunch with Mr. Gatsby. I turned toward Mr. Gatsby, but he was no longer there. Okay, so that is the end of um, part seven. Um, and again, we don't know necessarily know that's kind of a, a rude thing to do. And Gatsby hasn't shown, you know, that he's rude. So why would he just being introduced to Tom Buchanan? Why would he, you know, shake his hand, but not stay around and just kind of like bolt? Hmm. All right. So um, I'll see you next time for part eight.